In the great game of speculation, the distance between the amateur and the professional is measured not in courage but in mathematics. The amateur, driven by a single, powerful conviction, commits his capital in one heroic, all-or-nothing bet. He stakes his entire campaign on a single price, on a single moment in time. He's a plunger in the truest and most reckless sense of the word. The professional, however, understands that this is a fool's game, a certain path to ruin. He knows that a great position, like a great monument, is not created in a single explosive act, but is built methodically, piece by piece, on a foundation of proven success. This was the mathematical secret behind Jesse Livermore's greatest campaigns the science of pyramiding. He did not view his capital as a single bullet to be fired at one opportunity. He saw it as ammunition to be deployed strategically, his commitments growing only as the battle turned in his favor. He developed a system for building a massive line of stock, a method so effective and so contrary to the instincts of the average trader that it remains one of the most powerful yet least understood principles of professional speculation we can distill the essence of this method into a simple, actionable framework, the one-quarter pyramiding rule. It is a mathematical process for building a winning position while keeping your initial risk to an absolute minimum. This is not a theoretical exercise. It is a practical, step-by-step -step guide to the very mechanics that allowed Livermore to transform a small initial commitment into a colossal fortune-making line. It is the art of letting the market itself finance your greatest victories. To understand this rule is to understand the profound difference between a blind gamble and a calculated scientific speculation. It is to move from the world of the 90% who lose to the world of the 10% who win. The journey of a speculator is often a solitary one, marked by the intense pressure of making high-stakes decisions alone. It is easy to lose perspective, to be swayed by the noise of the crowd, or to falter in your discipline after a series of setbacks. This is why we created this channel, to serve as a constant source of these timeless principles, a place you can return to not just to learn, but to recalibrate your mindset. If you are committed to the path of a professional speculator, subscribe to our channel and return to these lessons. They are here to provide not just knowledge, but reinforcement and perspective when you need it most. Before we can understand the genius of Livermore's pyramiding method, we must first dissect the fatal flaw it was designed to prevent, the folly of the all-in bet. The amateur, once he has formed his opinion, feels a desperate urgency to establish his full position at once. He is terrified of missing the move. He buys his entire intended line at a single price, Maximizing his risk at the precise moment of maximum uncertainty, he has made his entire campaign vulnerable to a single adverse fluctuation. He has given himself no room for error, no chance to test his judgment. Livermore knew this was a strategic blunder of the highest order. Why, he reasoned, should a man commit his full force before he has received any confirmation from the market itself that his judgment is correct? It was illogical. It was impatient. It was, in a word, unprofessional. A general does not commit his entire army to the first skirmish. He sends out a probe, a small exploratory force to test the enemy's strength and position. Livermore's approach to the market was no different. This brings us to the first and most critical component of the rule. Step one, the one-quarter probe. Livermore would never enter a trade with his full intended line. If his plan was to ultimately accumulate, say, 20,000 shares of a stock, he would not begin by buying 20,000 shares. He would begin by buying a fraction of that amount, perhaps a quarter or 5,000 shares. This was his initial probe. Its purpose was not to make a great profit, but to gather information. It was his way of asking the market a direct question. Am I right? And is now the time? This initial commitment was made only at a critical, pivotal point, a moment he had identified through his patient study as the inception of a potential major move. But even with his analysis complete, he did not trust his own opinion alone. 
he demanded that the market itself provide the final deciding vote. The performance of this initial probe was the market's answer. It was the ultimate and most reliable confirmation of his entire thesis. The rule for interpreting this answer was absolute. The probe must show a profit almost immediately. If it did not, if the stock stagnated or declined after his initial purchase, it was an unequivocal signal that his timing was wrong. The line of least resistance was not yet clear. He would not wait, and he would certainly not add to the position. He would close it out, taking a small, predetermined loss on his initial small stake. This was the practical application of his most foundational rules, to cut losses quickly and to never average down. But if the probe was successful, if the stock moved in his favor and showed him a quick and decisive profit, it was a green light of the highest order. It was the market's own validation that his analysis of the trend, the group, the leading stock, and the timing were all correct. He was in harmony with the primary force of the market. He had been proven right, not by his own ego, but by the infallible verdict of the ticker tape. And it was only then, with this confirmed success in hand, that the next phase of the campaign could begin. Now Livermore knew what to look for on the tape, the immediate profit, the increase in volume, the character of the move. But why does the market behave this way? What are the unseen forces that create a powerful trend? For that, we turn to one of his great contemporaries, a man who didn't just practice the art of speculation, but who codified its science, Richard Wyckoff. While Livermore was the master practitioner, the intuitive genius of the tape, Wyckoff was the master analyst. He developed a method to map the unseen forces of accumulation and distribution, the very campaigns by large operators that Livermore was observing on the tape. To truly understand the why behind the what, to see the logic of supply and demand that makes a pivotal point work, we invite you to subscribe to our new channel, Richard Wyckoff Trading Methods. There, we dissect these foundational principles in detail. The link is in the description below. With the success of the initial probe confirmed, the checklist moves to the second aggressive step, step two, the second one-quarter edition. Having been proven right, the speculator's job is now to press his advantage. He would now add the second quarter of his intended line to his position. But there was a critical and non-negotiable condition for the second purchase. It must be made at a higher price than the first. This is the essence of pyramiding the art of averaging up that is so contrary to the amateur's instinct to buy cheap. To the losing trader, buying at a higher price seems like madness, but to the professional it is the height of logic. The first probe, by showing a profit, has already confirmed that the stock is in a position of strength. To buy more at a higher price is simply to add to that confirmed strength. You are not buying an expensive stock. You are buying a stock that is actively proving its own value on the tape. Each new high is a testament to the power of the underlying buying force. To add to your position is to align yourself further with that winning force. This second purchase transforms the nature of the trade. The speculator is now building a substantial line, but he is doing so on a foundation of success. The profit from his first purchase now acts as a financial and psychological cushion. He is, in a very real sense, letting the market finance his increased exposure. His risk on the second commitment is mitigated by the profit he already holds on the first. Furthermore, this is the moment where disciplined money management becomes paramount. With the second lot added to the position, the stop loss must be adjusted. Using the principle of the great gambler Pat Hearn, the professional might move his stop for the entire position to just below the price of his second purchase. This single, simple action often achieves a remarkable result. It can make the entire, now substantial trade virtually risk-free. If the market were to suddenly and violently reverse, the stop would be triggered. But the speculator would exit with either a small, insignificant profit or, at worst, at break-even. This is the mathematical genius of the pyramiding rule. It is a system for aggressively compounding a winning position 
while simultaneously and systematically reducing the overall risk. The amateur who goes all in at the start has 100% of his bet at risk from the very first tick. The professional who pyramids his position according to this one-quarter rule never has his full capital at risk. He builds his fortress brick by brick, ensuring the foundation is solid before he adds the next layer. He has now established the first half of his position, not on a hopeful guess, but on the market's own twice-confirmed validation. Having successfully established the first half of his position, the speculator who follows this disciplined mathematical method now stands in a position of immense strategic advantage. His trade is profitable. His risk is managed, with his initial capital likely protected by a carefully placed stop loss. The market itself, through its own favorable action, has given him a clear and unambiguous signal to press his advantage. This is where the amateur hesitates, fearful of his fragile profits. And this is where the professional, guided by the cold logic of his plan, enters the most aggressive and profitable phase of the campaign. The time has now come for step three, the third one-quarter edition. The stock, having confirmed its strength after the first two purchases, will often begin to accelerate its advance at this stage. The initial resistance has been overcome, and the trend is becoming obvious to a wider circle of market participants. The buying is becoming more general. This is not a time for caution. It is a time for calculated aggression. The speculator, adhering to his rule, will add the third quarter of his intended line, but only under the same strict condition as before. The purchase must be made at a new, higher price, typically after a minor consolidation or a fresh breakout. He is still and always averaging up. He is still and always reinforcing success. With this third edition, the position now becomes truly substantial. The psychological pressure of managing such a line can be immense, but the speculator is fortified by a powerful and comforting fact. He has a significant backlog of profit. The winnings from his first two commitments now serve as a massive cushion, not only protecting his initial capital, but also the capital used for his subsequent purchases. He is, in a very real sense, playing with the house's money. This is the source of the professional's poise, his ability to sit tight through the market's frightening but normal reactions. His confidence is not born of a reckless disposition, but of a sound mathematical and strategic position. The risk on his third commitment is almost entirely offset by the profit he already holds. The management of his stop loss is again adjusted, moved upward to protect the bulk of his accumulated gains. The trade is now not just a winning one, it is a fortress, its defenses growing stronger with every new advance. With three quarters of his line established, the speculator now waits for the final, often climactic, phase of the move. This is the stage where the stock enters a period of rapid, almost vertical ascent. Public excitement is at its peak. The news is universally bullish. The stock is making headlines. This is the moment of maximum opportunity and maximum danger. It is the moment that the professional will execute the final step of his accumulation plan, and the amateur will likely make his first fatal entry. Step four, the final one quarter, completing the line. The fourth and final quarter of the position is added under the same unwavering rule. It must be bought at a new higher price in a market that is demonstrating undeniable strength. The speculator now holds his full intended line. He has built a massive position, not with a single desperate all-in bet, but through a series of four disciplined, logical, and market-confirmed steps. His risk has been managed at every stage, and his commitment has grown only in proportion to his proven success. He now stands at the pinnacle of his campaign, in command of a great line of stock with the full force of a major trend at his back. Contrast his position with that of the amateur, the member of the losing 90%. The amateur is likely just now entering the trade for the first time. He is buying at the very high levels that the professional has helped to create, his purchase driven by the fear of missing out, 
by the euphoric stories of easy money. He is, in effect, buying the stock from the very professional who began patiently accumulating it at the very beginning of the move. With the full position now established, the speculator's job transitions from accumulation to pure management. His primary task is now the most difficult in all of speculation, the art of sitting tight. He must now have the courage and the patience to let the great move run its full logical course. He will be tempted every day by the fearful impulse to snatch his magnificent profit. He will be assailed by bearish rumors and minor nerve-wracking reactions. But he must hold firm, his resolve anchored to his initial sound analysis of the primary trend. This is where true fortunes are made. It was not the clever entries or the brilliant analysis that made Livermore his millions. He stated it himself with profound simplicity. It never was my thinking that made the big money for me. It always was my sitting. This is the final and greatest test of a speculator's character. The ability to correctly diagnose a market is a rare skill. The ability to have the courage to act on that diagnosis is rarer still. But the rarest and greatest of all is the ability to have the patience and the fortitude to sit tight and ride a great trend to its conclusion. The stop loss, which began as a tool for capital preservation, now becomes a tool for profit protection. It is trailed up methodically, always kept at a respectful distance from the current price, giving the stock room to have its normal reactions, but close enough to protect the vast bulk of the paper profit should the great trend finally, definitively, reverse. The exit is not based on a predetermined price target, but on a change in the market's own behavior, the reaction without a rally, or the definitive break of a reversal pivotal point. This, then, is the one-quarter pyramiding rule in its entirety. It is a complete holistic system for professional speculation. It begins with a small, cautious probe, and if validated by the market, evolves through a series of mathematically sound steps into a massive, powerful position. It is a method that forces a speculator to be right before he is aggressive, to be profitable before he is heavily committed. It is a system that automatically aligns a trader's largest bets with his most successful ideas, while ensuring his failures are always small and inconsequential. It is the ultimate expression of trading as a business. It is the polar opposite of the gambler's reckless plunge. It is a testament to the fact that the greatest fortunes are built not on a single lucky bet, but on a foundation of profound, unwavering, and mathematical discipline. To truly understand the mind of the man who mastered these principles, to witness the epic market battles where these rules were forged in the crucible of real-world profit and loss, the essential chronicle remains Edwin Lefebvre's 1923 masterpiece, Reminiscences of a Stock Operator. This is not merely a book, it is a deep psychological portrait of a master at work, a narrative that gives life and context to every one of these timeless rules. For those committed to this study, a link to the edition featuring a unique, detailed chapter-by-chapter -chapter analysis by Max Davidson, an interpretation specifically designed to translate this century-old wisdom for the modern reader, is provided in the description below.